All righty then, we are back, and we're going to create materials for the rest of our stuff. So this is going to be fun. Now, here's the trick, here's the gag, here's the thing. Uh, tonight, my goal is really to get you through the plate, the table, and the cake. And each one of those gets progressively more intricate as we go, the cake being the most intricate. Your job will be to create a material for the whipped cream, which is so simple that it's almost painful. And you will have to create a material for the cherry. Now that can be simple or it can be complex, but th that was, that's just kind of a peek ahead at your homework. Also, if you have created some other object, which I'm sure a few of you have, I would also like you to create some sort of a material for that. If it, fi if it ends up being too strenuous or stressful with uh, UVs and whatnot, just make a flat material. I won't care. I won't hold it against you. Okay, so next thing we're going to handle is the table for our little guy here. And NATO, um, just in case you know, that's what it's going to be. So if you actually wanted to start kind of drafting out a homework thread, you've got all the info you really need. Yeah, it is optional. So if you've got it, you know, throw a material on it so it doesn't look, you know, flat, bland, gray, out of place in your render. But like I said, if it's just too stressful, you can just put a basic flat material, just like a, a color, and call it even. Okay, next we want to handle our table. So I'm going to start off here in my hypershade. Uh, let me go ahead and hide out uh, everything but the work area. Let's right-click, go to Graph, and choose Clear Graph. Goodbye. So I have a blank work area. Now, as we did before, I'm going to create the tables material out of a fong. I like to use fongs unless I know I need something that is highly metallic, and then I'll reach for a blend. If I know something doesn't need to be shiny in any way, then I'll use a lamber. But those are my three major go-tos. So we'll be using a lot of fongs, probably really exclusively fongs, uh, in this particular demonstration. So let's middle mouse drag, middle mouse drag, so don't right-click drag, uh, a fong out into play. There it is. And let's immediately rename it. This will be Matt underscore table. Like so. And we'll zoom up on it for no reason at all. Now, here's where things get fun. Uh, let me open up a browser. Let's go to 3D Buzz. Everybody needs to do this. Everybody needs to open up a browser. You need to go to the forums. You need to go to the member sponsor lounge. You need to go to the uh, streaming video support files thread. And then to the little link inside the first thing there. And there's the address. So you can just go straight to that. So it's vbforum slash sv underscore ms underscore streaming underscore files dot php. And that'll take you right there. And... Um, as of right now, this is still new, but under Maya Classes, you'll see Maya 101 Textures. Download that, if you please. And even if you don't, please, download it anyway. Now, once you have those, you need to get them placed somewhere. And I want to show you where I want you to put them just so that everybody is kind of on the level, so that everybody is, uh, you know, enjoying nice, clean organization. Let me get it open over here, so let's go... Here's where I have all of my stuff. If I go under Documents, and I go... Most of these are games, so that's great. Uh, go under Maya, and we go into Projects. So here is my Maya 101 class for Tuesday. Go under your Source Images file or a source images folder. That's where I want you to put these. And there's the RAR that you're going to download. If you have WinRAR, you can just right click and choose extract here. And that'll put both those in. You have uh, furniture base wood and text flame base. Which we're not going to use for flame at all. We're going to reuse it and do something else entirely. But I want you to make sure you have both of those and Wick has been an absolute doll, and he's given you all a link to it. So there you go. 
Now, I don't put it in the images of the project folder. I put it in the source images because your renders will end up automatically saving to the images folder. So think of the images folder as output and source images as input, i.e. source images. So anyway, once you have those, we can continue. So I'll give everybody just a real quick pause and a ready check. Okay, everybody has their texture, and it is now time for us to make the material for our table, which we've already made. We just need to make it look better. So if you scroll down in your list, not this far, good lord, uh, you'll see the file node. Now you can just click and create one if you want to. In fact, let's just do that, just you know, for the fun of it. So we'll just click and make a file node. Notice it comes in with a place 2D texture node. That's good. You want that. Also, I'm kind of throwing this out there as a thing. It's good form, but I don't often do it, especially in beginner level classes. But it's often a good idea to rename all of your nodes. So like file one, you know, you'd maybe call this mat underscore table underscore, I'm sorry, text underscore table underscore wood texture, but I often will forget to do that in classes. So it would be something like text, so you know it's a texture, not material. You know it's part of the table, and then say wood. That way you know at a glance what this is for. If I forget to do that, I'm really sorry, but at least get your materials name so you can see what they are, you can graph them out, and et cetera, and so forth. Okay, now let's get our texture actually in here. You need to make sure that your attribute editor is open. And then inside the attribute editor, you'll see image name, and there's a little tiny manila folder. Click on that. And if you put your files in the source images folder, get a load of this. It opens right up to that location by default. How awesome is that? Grab furniture base wood. Isn't that a nice wood, by the way? That was off the side of a big... Um, uh, china cabinet that Jason had in his living room for a long time. I just took a digital photo of it and cleaned it up very, very slightly to get rid of the glare. So, there you go. Now, we need to get this connected to the color. There's a couple of ways to do that. My favorite way, as you might have already seen, is to middle-click, drag, and just choose color. But there's another way as well. You see this little tiny hollow triangle? You can click on that Well, you can right-click on it, actually. So if you hold down the right mouse button, you can choose what property you'd like to output. And this, is, this gets a little technical, I'm going to warn you. But we're going to choose Out Color. Now that has its own sub-menu because you can choose red, green, or blue. We want Out Color, full Out Color. That's red, green, and blue together. So once more, on that little hollow triangle for the output, right-click, choose Out Color, and Out Color, and then you get a rubber band line right click on the little input next to mat table or on the uh, lower left corner of mat table and just choose out color out color oh excuse me no just left click sorry left click and just choose color thank you so one more time because even i confuse myself because i never do this by the way i'm just doing it for academic purposes uh right click choose out color and out color then just left click and choose color and that plugs it right in now, I don't like doing that. Generally, I will just middle click, drag, and just choose color. The reason that works is that the color output or the out color from this file node is kind of its default purpose. So uh, that's Maya going, oh, you're using a file node. That's pretty cool, dude. I guess that means you kind of want the color information from that file. Well, here you go. I'll go ahead and plug that into whatever you tell me to. And, and that works out really well. So let's get this applied. So we'll middle mouse drag this on top of our table, and voila, we have a great big table that is nicely colored and looks like wood. Uh, if you want your wood to, you know, repeat a little more, then you can play with your place 2D texture node. I think with this texture, I don't know how tileable this is. I really don't remember. Um, actually, it looks like it tiles reasonably well. Uh, you just have to watch out for that, because it actually does kind of look like two planks, though I guess you could use that to your advantage as well. Now let's see, if I do one in U and two in V, that's not too horrible. So if I set repeat UV to one and two, that actually looks okay. And you guys, you got to forgive me. Sometimes when it gets late at night and it's like 8.30 here, I've been working all day, I will regress and start having fun and playing with silly accents and and things like that. If it gets too much for you, just tell me to stop, and I will um, 
laugh at you and probably consider it for a minute. Okay, so next, this is where it starts to get a little bit fun. Um, let's do this. Just middle mouse drag once again. So back from your texture, right back onto the material a second time and choose bump map. And take a look at what it does. It plugs the out alpha, which in this case is kind of like a black and white image of the texture, right into the bump. Then here's what I want you to do. Do you see what it's doing? It may be a little difficult to tell until you pull the bump depth way down. But it's kind of doing exactly what it should. It's just, without really knowing wood very well, you don't really realize this is inverted. If you take the bump and you actually flip it around to a negative number, it gets much closer to the way wood grain tends to really work so that the darker areas are a little bit more recessed. But it's it's a tiny, tiny difference. So even this is way too much. So do something like negative 0 0.005. Let's see what that looks like. That's not enough. We need, let's double that to 0 0.01. Okay, and I'm really steadily increasing this. No, I don't have magic numbers here. I literally am testing and seeing what stuff looks like. Uh, 0.3 is too much. Let's try 0.2. And that's closer to what I'm looking for. Just the tiniest little bit of lump and bumpiness to make this work. Now, way back when, uh, when I still had, well, among other things, I had a status line that I hadn't turned off yet. I had set my rendering engine to mental ray. If you need to do this, you may go over to your render settings. They're in your status line. You'll see the little clapboard with two circles next to it. If you click on that, you may notice that it says render using uh, mental ray. And if you click on this, you may not see mental ray. I think I went over this in this class, but if for some reason I didn't, if for some reason it's not there, uh, then you need to go, if you don't see mental ray, go under window, settings preferences, and go to the plugin manager because mental ray is really a Maya plugin. So again, that's Windows, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager. Scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's Maya to MR, um, or Maya to Mental Ray, literally. Make sure that's loaded and set to auto load if you haven't already. So if you haven't done that, do it. If you have done it, Merry Christmas, it's already done. And make sure that you take your render settings and render using Mental Ray, and you can do a quick test render. And see, in this case, we get a little bit of reflection. But a neat thing about that, if I get really close and get kind of an incident angle, about like so, you can already see where that reflection is getting perturbed by the wood grain. I mean, how awesome is that, really? So that's the big reason we do that, is that it starts to break up the render. Now, that render is going to look like poo right now. We don't have, uh, I don't have any lighting and and all that kind of thing. We don't have any shadows, obviously. But I just wanted to show you that that's kind of how that works. Now, here's the neat thing. Uh, well, okay, maybe not the neat thing. This might frustrate one or two of you. Uh, if you're one of those one or two people, then I apologize. But watch this. Grab all of our material nodes and delort them. Goodbye. Right-click, assign existing material, go all the way back to Lambert 1. Now we're going to do something a little fancy. Just for a minute. We're going to go to Panels. Jump down to Panels, and let's open up the Node Editor. Dun, dun, dun. We're going to recreate that same material using the Node Editor. This way, you'll have seen both ways to do it. Now, after this point, I'm going to assume that you'll have a general idea of what the Node Editor is. If you're new to Maya, listen very closely when I say this. If you're new to Maya, I do not recommend that you use the Node Editor. Why? Because when you're in the hypershade, you get that nice list of all of the nodes that you have access to, and sometimes it's nice to be able to flip through that, kind of like your big toy box, and go like, ooh, I want one of these and not one of those. The node editor kind of assumes that you already know what you want. Because uh, if you don't know, it's going to be very difficult for you to figure it out. So I would stick with the hypershade until you really have a solid feeling for the types of nodes that you need. And then later on, once you have a, a good, solid understanding of that, then come back to this part of the video or, or this part of, of your notes if you're taking them, and I kind of hope you are, and then start playing with the note editor. The good news is the note editor is very, very easy to use. First off, it tells you how it works. It says press tab to create a note. Awesome. So we hit tab. Then you have to type the name of the note. This is why I don't really recommend that super, uber, duper, mega beginners play with it too much. But here you go. Fong. We know we need a fong. So there's all kinds of stuff we could create. Uh, this is a, a mental ray version of a Fong. Uh, we have the Fong E. So just click on Fong. 
and then press enter, and that makes a fong node. You also have the shading group node. This was there the whole time. It just doesn't show up in the hypershade by default. So it's always there. We just didn't see it. Now, a quick thing about the node editor. What is the node editor? It is like a combination of the connection editor, which we haven't seen too much of, if at all, the hypershade, and the hypergraph. It's everything all in one. And in a lot of ways, it simplifies some of the jobs that you'll do in the hypershade. Now, for really simple materials, it's actually a little bit more involved, but I want you to be able to see it anyway. By the way, if anybody out there is following along and you don't have Maya 2013 and you don't have this, feel free to fast forward unless you're watching live and then just fold your hands and absorb as much as you can. So I'm going to select Fong 4 and let's rename this. We'll call this Matt underscore table because we deleted the last one. There we go. And that's perfect. Now, we need a few things. Do you remember uh, what we had in here? What was the next thing we added? Can anybody tell me? This is, this is for a, a cookie with icing on it. File! Creative HD, got it. So, we just put our mouse someplace, hit tab, and type file. And you'll kind of have to look closely. You'll see file texture. So click on that and press enter. Just like before, it comes in with a Place 2D Texture node. It's just now you can see all the different connections that are wired up. Isn't it kind of pretty? I think so. And, just as before, we're going to name this. We'll call this text underscore table underscore wood. Next to image name, just as before, we'll click on the little manila envelope. Grab furniture base wood. Click open. Now, here's where it gets to be fun. Last time, we took out color and plugged it into color with a couple of different methods. In the node editor, it's just a matter of dragging from one dot to another dot. Eek. Done. Bump maps don't work quite as smoothly. They get a little bit more involved because... When we made this in the Hypershade, Maya automatically created a Bump 2D node for us. The node editor is not going to do that by default. So what we're going to do, or at all as far as I know, so we're going to hit Tab and type in Bump, and there's Bump 2D. Create one of those and press Enter. Now, make a note, my lovelies. When trying to plug this in manually, you want to plug into bump value. Bump depth is what you edit to make the bump higher or lower. Bump value is incoming data. So we're going to take out alpha, plug that right into bump value. We take out normal and plug that into normal camera. So that's why I said this is a little bit more involved than it is in the Hypershade. We also took our Place 2D Texture node, and if I remember, we did one by two, I think. So that's it. We've essentially created the same network. I did also pull my bump depth down to negative point oh, let's just do two five. Now, I'm trying to leave this as wide open as I can so that those who haven't seen this before uh, have a, a nice opportunity to get all the connections down. So, what I'm going to do is do a quick ready check. Okay, so, we get, again, we've created the exact same material network that we had in the Hypershade. We've just made it using the node editor. Uh, let's go ahead and bring back the, uh, the attribute editor. We can just middle mouse drag that right back on top of the table, just like we did before. So it works very much like the Hypershade. It's just a different approach. Now, I do want to point this out. Each one of these nodes has this little icon in the upper right corner that allows you to change how it's drawing. So it has full, uh, you know, full display, medium, and then kind of fully collapsed. So there's primary attributes, there's connected attributes, and then uh, hide attributes on selected nodes. So if we click this once, check it out. Everything is hidden. So if we set that to its smallest little value there, with a little tiny square, basically everything gets crushed. Now, how is that useful to you? Well, at a glance it isn't, but you can still see how each one of these nodes connects to all of his buddies. 
Now, if you set it to the, the mid, uh, middle status, only those attributes which are connected are visible. There you go. And there you go. And then if you set it all the way up, it shows you everything, whether it's connected or not. So those are kind of like your three visibility standards. Okay, so let's go ahead and for now we're going to go back to the hypershade. I just kind of wanted to point that out, and I wanted to point it out on a relatively simple uh, material, because if I try to do it with something super complex, I feel like I would give folks a really nasty bit of a headache. So let's go back over to the hypershade. And it looks like everybody's pretty much got that, so let's move on to creating the material for our cake. And here's how we're going to do this. Now, this is, well, in terms of the kinds of shaders I have made in my life, this is really not that bad at all. Um, however, it is more involved than anything we've made so far because I'm going to do a couple of fairly fancy things. But we're going to start it off very, very simple. So let's begin again with a fong. So I'm just going to middle mouse drag a fong out. And let's go ahead and name it. So this will be Matt underscore cake. Uh, icing. Now, notice I didn't put an underscore between cake and icing. That's because they're part of the same thought. And this is uh, like w one of my little naming conventions. Uh, if you know, if if it was like cake and a separate part of the cake, like maybe the uh, whipped cream on top, then I would have an underscore. But really, this is part of the cake object itself. It just happens to be the icing, so that later on, if you know, I had some other aspect of the cake, then you know, you get a name. Anyway, that's just me. All right, so we've got that. We got a name. Let's give this a color. Now, you can use whatever color you want. You don't have to use the same thing I'm doing. I'm doing kind of like the generic chocolate icing. So let's set our color to orange, and then basically brown, uh, for all intents and purposes, is just a dark orange. So I'll make a brown, and then I'll just middle mouse drag and apply this right to my cake. So really, in a lot of ways, you're kind of done. <laughs> Okay, now I have a few other settings that I uh, set up for this particular material, mostly having to do with how it handles reflectivity and specularity. So a reflectivity, I pull almost off. So I have it down really, really low, like 0.075 or so. That just means if one were looking really closely, you might see a little bit of a reflection. I would not hold it against you. In fact, it might be a good idea just to slam that all the way to zero. Because in the end, you're looking at this guy from really far away, and there's so many facets and so many changes in the surface with all the icing that you probably won't be able to see any reflections anyway. Uh, generic note editor question. Message seems to be common to everything. Seeing it everywhere like like that makes me think it's supposed to be useful. Is it? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Um, usually when I see message, like in between connections and nodes, uh, that is something that popped up a few uh, versions of Maya ago. And it basically means that there's a lot of connections going from one node to another. But I'm not sure if we're talking the same thing. So, uh, let me go ahead and just kind of move forward with this for the time being. I'm going to jump down to uh, my settings for cosine power. You're welcome to play with these. And, you know, of course, your mileage may vary. I'm going to pull my cosine power down to 3.5-ish. So right now I've got uh, 3.675. The reason is that you know if you want if you want this to look like fresh icing like that really goopy kind that sticks to your fingers it's you know kind of like you know well you can make it very very tight and very plasticky. I have seen cake icing that looks like this, but most like the generic cake icings that I've seen, they just have a, a much wider specular highlight. I did look at a lot of pictures of cake to make this happen. If you see ghost cake, it might be because you took your transparency up. Oh, yeah. The cake really is a lie. All right. Uh, you guys had to know that joke was going to get floated out here somewhere. All right. Next, I have my uh, specular color pulled down. And in my case, actually, we're going to end up changing it. So I've got it darkened up a lot. But we're going to end up mapping something to that anyway, meaning there will be some sort of a texture or another node plugged in to drive that. 
So that's pretty much it. There is our basic cake icing. Obviously, though, that's going to be a little bit boring, and we want to do something quite a bit more interesting than that. So what I want you to do is grab a file node and bring that into play. And let's go ahead and name this. We're going to call this text underscore cake underscore bump. Actually, let's call this icing bump. Uh, no. Well, yeah. I think I'm going back and forth with my convention a little bit, but as long as I can read it, I'll go with it for now. Yeah, it's, it really does suck when you uh, crash Maya when saving. That's probably the most painful crash ever. So I'm really sorry, Saturn, that that had to happen. Okay, so now I'm going to take my uh, file node. Let's click on the little manila folder next to the file, and we'll drop in uh, text flame base. Now, this is a texture that I put together for the Unreal books years ago. I've, if memory serves, I made it in ZBrush. And at the time, I remember thinking that this was a lot like dragging a knife through icing. And for some reason, that memory bubbled back up to the surface while I was making the uh, shader for this cake, or making the material for this cake, and I gave it a try and it looked really good. So once you have that, you can middle mouse drag and apply this to the bump map. And you'll probably get something that looks like this. Generally looks horrible. Now, I'm going to take my bump depth and pull that... Well, actually, let me just leave it alone for now. I don't worry about changing it. I mean, because we can really... I do love how the, the high-quality viewport allows you to really see the result of that bump map. Because, I mean, seriously, doesn't that really look like the surface is changing? And anyway, I'm impressed by the very, very simple. Okay, but obviously we need to fix this up. We're going to do this by changing the UVs for our cake. Uh, this was modeled out in polygons, a lot of extrusions, a lot of things that will leave you some really wacky UVs. As a matter of fact, if we go to uh, Window and open up the UV Texture Editor, here's what our UVs look like. It's just this one little tiny disk in the lower corner, and everything else is just repeated and stretched over the edge, and that's not good at all. However, we're going to keep things very, very simple. I'm going to tell you kind of a trick. Know in advance the direction in which you will be animating the scene. What do I mean? Well, I would like to animate in Z forward. I want the Z axis to be pointing forward when I animate. So you see the little tiny uh, coordinates in the lower left-hand corner of my screen? I have rotated the view such that Z points from the upper left to the lower right. That's the direction my cherry is going to bounce at the end of the day. Now, why is that important? Well, I'll show you. Because what we're going to do to create our UVs, and let me just tap spacebar here so I have a nice big screen, is just select your cake, press F3 to make sure you're in the polygon menu set, then go to create UVs and do spherical mapping. Now, this creates a little hemisphere that wraps around the cake. If you just press F8 right now, you see, that's a pretty good start. From here on out, you can adjust your Place 2D Texture node and get things pretty much taken care of at this point. So if I take Repeat U, maybe set that to 2. Actually, I could live with that. I don't really need to change too much more than that. The only thing, and this may be more important for some of you than it is for others, it really depends on how big your whipped cream is. The only thing is that you'll notice your uh, cake icing strokes getting tighter and tighter up toward the very top of the cake. That may not be a problem. In fact, even here, I wouldn't even worry about it. If you absolutely had to change it, I want to show you a trick. Because we have construction history, we still have access to that polysphere projection node. So, basically, I can select my cake, 
and underneath its inputs you'll see polysphere projection one. I can click on that and I can use all of the little manipulators all over this guy. If you didn't realize this is the show manipulator tool if you're unfamiliar with it. It basically changes depending on what you got going on. And say I grab this green handle at the top. Now I'm middle mouse dragging just for those of you who need to know that. So I can middle mouse drag and you can see how that's changing the placement of the texture. So I can close the sphere off at the top I can use the red handle and close the sphere off all the way around. Now here's where things get really, really dicey, and I'm not really expecting everybody to follow along, because I, I sincerely believe if you don't change any of these coordinates, you'll still end up with something that looks just fine. But there's this little tiny line uh, you'll find here on the tool. Uh, it's a it looks like a little red letter T, and if you click on that, it'll give you the traditional manipulator, like what you have when you extrude, and you could actually take the entire thing and rotate it to the side. And what is that doing? Well, that's taking the little pinched areas and moving them to the sides of the cake. That means you could take the poles, essentially, of that uh, projector and rotate them away from the angle the camera will see them. Now, if you're lost right now, if you're like, I don't understand anything you're doing, then don't worry about it. I'll just undo all the way back to right as we first applied that spherical uh, projection because that works just fine. This does a great job of getting our point across. But if you wanted to control where the poles of that spherical projection were, that's how you'd do it. You'd select your, your cake, click on your input node, and then you can use the manipulators across this. Just click with middle mouse, and you can make a lot of changes to how that's mapped across the surface. As a matter of fact, you don't even really need to play too much with your Place 2D Texture node if you're careful. You can just control your mapping here. But I think this is going to work out just fine for us. I just wanted to kind of point that out in case folks wanted to play with that. So here we go. We've got our bump in place. Uh, if we Let me open up my attribute editor again. Now, that was some crazy bump settings that I had. Definitely make sure that you're using the proper direction. Notice if you go negative, you get these really weird raised spots. I personally think that positive numbers look better here. But that's just me. Also, do not take even the high-quality renderer as gospel. What do I mean when I say that? Well, you see how kind of chunky this looks? When you render, it's not really that chunky at all. So definitely keep in mind that some things are being uh, altered a bit by the high-quality renderer. It's high-quality, not perfect quality. Okay, let's do a quick ready check for folks who are catching up to this point. All right, so we've got basically just a brown material with a bump map that gives us some nice swirls in the cake. Now we're going to get a little bit fancy. Nothing super duper fancy. All we're really going to do is make a network that allows us to have two separate bump maps that are blended together. And here's kind of what I'm talking about. Uh, let me go to Photoshop. And I just want to give you sort of a rundown of what it is I want to do. If we take a look at our cake, actually let me jump over to my just one more time. So our cake has raised areas, and then it's got a lot of these little indentations, like creases or crevices in the swirl, right? What I would like to have happen, just because I think it's cool and it's the way cakes tend to work, uh, these swirls are usually created by dragging a knife across the surface of the icing, right? Well, in between those swirls, you end up with lumps. So if you take a cross section, you'd have your raised area, maybe that flattens out, and then you'd have these little crevices. And of course, this crevice would, you know, snake around and, and be all swirly if looked at from above. What I would like to have happen is that on the un, like down inside these crevices, we had some general lumpy bumpiness. It's all smooth up here where the knife uh, ran across the outside of the icing, but down here in all the crevices, I want there to be another layer of bump. So that's what we're going to do. Now this does get moderately fancy, but it's really not that bad. First off, we need to create a second bump map. So I'm going to make a little more room here, and then do something a little bit scary, a little bit crazy. I'm going to take the connection between our bump map and our cake, and I'm just going to delete it. Now with that gone, I'm going to grab a noise node, middle mouse drag that right onto my material and just choose bump map.
Now you can see the seam for this. You can fix that. Um, I really, if I was, this was you know production on my end, I would just take the cake and rotate it such that the seam was pointing away from the audience. That's perfectly legal. No reason why you can't do that. Um, but you know, just something to think about. Now let's play with this noise just a little. First off, again with the amplitude, because that creates those funny little flattened areas where the color's going to full white. So I'm going to pull the amplitude back. And as soon as you hit right around 0.5, you should have no more perfectly flattened spots. We'll pull this down about like so. And then we need these lumps to be a lot tinier. So I'm going to go to my Place 2D Texture node. And I'm just going to repeat this four times in U and V. Then I need a really tiny bump depth. So if I go to my new Bump 2D node, let's take my bump depth, and I'm going to pull this down to like 0.05. Let me see if 0.055 looks any better. You can hardly tell, can you? Maybe 0.06? Eh, anywhere right in there should do. But it just creates some general lumpiness all over the cake. All right, now here's what we need. We basically need to establish a system where we're gonna we're gonna be using our cake swirl. So if I if I was to plug this back in, which I'm gonna do real quick, uh, just by dragging from middle mouse drag, excuse me, middle mouse drag from my bump 2D node back onto my material and just choose bump map, and that'll reconnect it. So this is gonna be our base. And our goal is to use this such that down inside the crevices, we actually see this. Got it? Even if you don't, here's how we're going to do it. We can't actually plug both of these bump maps into one material. We've got to blend them together. And to do that, there's a special node that exists in Maya. Let me go ahead and close this and close this. Uh, called the Blend node. So if you scroll way down on the list, you'll see Blend Colors. Now, I'll give you guys a tip. Uh, because this is Maya, and because Maya's entire architecture is node-based, Blend Colors does a lot more than just blend colors. It will blend all kinds of things. It will even blend animations if one is so clever as to bring an animated character into the hypershade. If that just blew your mind, don't worry. Good night, Ben. So, here's what I want you to do. Let's disconnect our bump map altogether. And we're going to start with our noise. And we're going to plug my noise into, actually into color 2. There's a re let, me, let me show you kind of how a, a blend colors works first. That would probably be a little bit easier if I did that. Um, for the time being, do I need to record this or is it still in here? It's still in there. It's in a color swatch. That's good. Let me take my blend colors node, and just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to plug it right into my color. And I immediately get a purple cake. Now, let's check out the blend color node. It has two colors, color one and color two, and then it has the blender attribute. See if you can figure out how this works. There it is at zero. Here it is at one. See how that works? It just allows you to blend between whatever these two values are. So there it is at halfway, where we actually get purple. What we're going to do, though, is plug our bump maps into this. So let's start with our noise. Uh, because if you take a look, 0 actually equals color 2. It's, and to me, it's kind of counterintuitive, but you know nobody asked me. It's because we're going uh, between a 0 to 1 system, so 0 to 1 for the slider, and then 1 and 2 here. So the value of 0 on the slider actually equals color 2. A value of 1 actually equals color 1. Keep that in mind. So if you think I'm plugging it in backwards, it's only because, as far as I'm concerned, they coded this thing backwards. So let's start with our noise, and we'll plug that into color 1. Let me show you a neat way to do this. You can take your Bump 2D node, middle mouse drag it right onto color 1. Then take your Bump 2D node for your, your uh, icing, middle mouse drag that onto color 2. 
Does that look cool since you're plugging that into color? I just thought I'd point that out. It's that, in a way that's too bad we can't keep that. Now, I want to give everybody a quick ready check to see who got up to this point. Okay, we're back. Now, after some careful deliberation, I'm actually going to change the way I'm going to do this very, very slightly to sort of simplify things. Uh, earlier, we took our noise bump and we plugged that into color one, and then we took our, uh, our other icing texture and we plugged that into color two. I want you to reverse those, actually. So, I'm going to delete that. So I'm going to take my noise and plug that into color two and plug my icing into color one. So it should be a really quick change to make. Basically, this means we can do away with one node that is kind of superfluous in my original design. And I was looking at it going like, why do we have a reverse node in there? Oh, because we could just hook those up backwards. So I'm making this more efficient on the fly. So once again, the bump from my noise is plugged into color two. The bump from the actual icing texture, that's plugged into color one. Didn't I already have that? Is that how I did it before? I don't think so. Let me see. I'm double checking. No, I had it exactly the opposite of that. Or at least I did. No, but here I can show you why. Because before, I mean, the, the, the wires look exactly like they did before. That's just Maya being difficult. Uh, but before, the way I had this hooked up was like this. And you saw that I had this cool little nasty um, multicolored thing all over the place. What I want to see, uh, and this is, again, with the blender slid all the way over to zero... What I want to see, actually, is the bump for, uh, for the noise. So essentially what I've got to do is plug the noise into color 2, plug the icing into color 1. Now, why am I doing that? Well, earlier, I can actually prove to you why before we even hook it up. I showed you guys that what I wanted was to have bump down inside the crevices of my icing. So when we get down really low, we want things to get kind of bumpy down here and then smooth back out as we get to the icing. Consider a bump map. If we draw another cross-section without the extra bumpiness, what colors should we have here? We should have white, or approaching white. We should have white here as well. And we should have black here. Does that make sense to everybody? So, a few yeses. Nobody rolling in freaking out on me, so we'll go ahead and move forward. Now, we're also using our blender. And if you recall, our blender in the blend node goes from 0 to 1. Where 0, everybody remember what 0 actually equals on a blend node? 0 is actually color 2. 1 is color 1. And yes, SJC, you get a cookie, but I think you said it after I said it. I'm going to pretend like you did anyway. So, I mean, your cookie's a little stale, just so you know. So, here's some other things about the number zero. Zero is equal to black. White is equal to one. So, we want our noise to be plugged into color two so that our noise appears down here. We want our icing to be plugged into color one so that our icing is basically everywhere else. There's really only one more thing that is left. And that is to drive our blender so that we don't have to manually do a slide. See, here's the cool thing. Every time you see this little tiny checker next to a, an attribute inside the, uh, the attribute editor, that means you can map something to it. We're going to map a texture to the blender, and it will change the, the value of the slider on a pixel-by-pixel -pixel basis. Anybody want to take a, a guess, just a random guess, as to what we're going to plug into the blender?
Yep, our fire texture or the the icing. Very good. So Wick, you get like a like a really awesome. You know, like when you get Oreo cookies and you get like the double stuff cookies, but then you take two of them apart, so you have these two really huge. You know, just you know, just the icing alone. You take the extra tops, you throw them away or eat them later. But then you mash those two together, so you end up with like a quad stuffed Oreo. That's what you just got. No, not an orange one. The mint ones. Okay, so uh, here's all we're going to do. Just take your texture for the icing. Watch this really closely. I'm going to middle mouse drag that. And notice, you don't even see Blender here. Here's why. This is by default trying to take the output color. Output color is red, green, and blue information. That's three different numbers. All trying to plug into the Blender. You can't plug three numbers into one number. Maya doesn't like it. Well, actually, you can. You just can't do it all at once. So what we're going to do instead, just middle mouse drag from your texture, not your bump node. Get your bump node out of the way, actually. From your texture, right onto the blend color node, and choose Other. And you get the Connection Editor. One more thing that's been made obsolete by the Node Editor. Now watch this. If I click out color, notice Blender completely grays out. I cannot plug out color into Blender. However, out color has this little plus button next to it. So if I click this, I can choose out color red, green, or blue. And if I choose just one of those, suddenly my Blender highlights because Blender is one number and so is out color R. Now in the case of a black and white image, red, green, and blue will all be the same value as each other. There won't be any difference between red and green and blue, so let's leverage that. We'll take out color R and plug that into Blender. Our final step is to just kind of put our material back to where it was. This does not need to be plugged into color at all. We're actually done with the connection editor, so I'm going to close it. Out alpha is a combination of the RGB if there's no supplied alpha channel. In some cases, with some file formats, I've seen it look for an alpha channel. If it doesn't find one, it'll just basically return black. So uh, what I'll do often, and really just for academic purposes, I like to illustrate the fact that you can take color information, separate it out to a single channel, and just use that. And I use that trick for a lot of different things, particularly if you have a texture that you like to use that has a lot more red, or maybe the reds are more dramatic, you can use that to drive something and end up with a much more dramatic result, which I think is a pretty slick way to handle the problem. If you lost your work area, remember again to go under tabs, <clears throat> excuse me, and choose revert to default tabs. And hopefully that should bring it back. Okay, now we just need to reset <clears throat> our material back to where it was with a regular color. Uh, before I do that, let me just show this connection one more time for those who need to see it. So if you missed that the first time, please pay attention this time. I'm going to middle mouse drag from my texture over to the blend and choose other. I can expand out color. You can use out alpha if you want to. That'll plug right into Blender if you want. But just kind of to show you how cool this is, you can separate your out color into its red, green, and blue channels and just plug the red channel right into Blender. Notice at the top it says from to. So we're going from left to right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so there we go. That's all working. Now, we don't need this plugged into color, so I'm just going to select the color connection and disconnect it. I'll middle mouse drag this back over, and we're going to plug it into the bump map. Now, notice we get a little bit of a warning here. As a matter of fact, it created another bump 2D node. That's bad. We don't want to do that. Just delete that guy. We need to do this manually. So this is one of those things where you kind of need to know how bump maps work. Bump map takes a texture, runs it through a bump 2D node, and plugs that into the out normal of a material. So here's what we're going to do. Middle mouse drag from your blend onto your material, and once again, choose other. Now this is where things get a little bit fun. I am going to say this very slowly so that everybody gets it on the first time. So one more time. Middle mouse drag from your blend onto your material and choose other. What you're looking for on your, on your material is normal camera. 
I'm willing to wager most of you won't see it. You'll see a big long list and you'll scan through this for an hour and you still won't see normal camera. It's not the same as triangle normal camera. It's because on your right display you need to say show hidden. Maya takes the liberty of hiding a whole bunch of attributes on a material because there's a lot of things that you tend not to use too much. More often than not, you don't need normal camera because Maya is really good about automatically creating a bump 2D node for you. But in this case, we've got to get a little fancy. So, we take the output and we plug that into the normal camera. And there's what we get. Now, if you need to see that again for some reason, <clears throat> here's how it goes. First, middle mouse drag from your blend onto your material and choose Other. Make sure your right display has Show Hidden activated, otherwise you won't see normal camera. Oh, you do see it. Oh, I didn't used to see it. Ha ha, I'm doing some old school stuff. So yeah, you do see it these days. That's awesome. So anyway, you're going to plug your output into the normal camera like so. Long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, that didn't used to be there. So I guess they've made it more visible. So we can just all kind of point and laugh. But at least you also now know how to show any additional properties that you may want to connect to that weren't there before. So once that's connected, Really, all you need to do, and if your cake starts to look really weird, remember, the high-quality renderer is not perfect. It was never intended to be. We just need to set our color back up, so I'm going to click on my color swatch, and my brown is still there. So I can just click on that, and I'm done. I can now hit render, and there's my cake. And if we get really close to it, we are starting to get lumps and bumps down inside in between the crevices. Now how pronounced that is, we can control. We can take the noise and we can increase its bump depth, which is probably not going to show up too terribly well. Uh, actually, you can see the, the high quality renderer is trying to produce that, but it's bogging down a little bit. So let's try another render. And there you go. Now you can really see what it's doing because we're driving that just way, way high. But I wouldn't leave it that high. I would leave that pretty low. Like, uh, what did I have it? Maybe 0.06. And let's do another render. For now, do not worry about warnings that you get in the output window. All right, folks, that's it. That is the length and breadth of my demonstration for the evening. Let's talk briefly about your assignment, which I know we kind of already have. But let's make it semi-official, or mostly official. Homework. Make materials. Ha-ha, it's pretty easy, isn't it? So, you need to make sure that your plate, and your cake, and your table are all done. Now, I showed you how to do these. Those were all demoed. You need to come up with material, or materials, could be plural, for your cherry. And, if you made another object, make a material for that too. Now, I'm not being super restrictive on how difficult you make your cherry material. Oh yeah, and the whipped cream, thanks. So, you will make materials for all of these objects. The hard stuff has already been done. Honestly, if you, are, if you feel really, really lost, you can just make a simple red for your cherry and that will work. Uh, your whipped cream can just be white. Though adding a bump map will make all the difference in the world, I promise. 
Uh, and your other object, again, that can also just be a flat material if you so desire. I am not being a real stickler. I just want to see that you have materials applied. Can we hand paint a texture? Yeah, I want to say yes. NATO, are you around? Are you still here? Did you did you duck out? No, you're still here. I'm still here. You're still here. Okay, let's talk about this for just a minute. Up to now, they've been sending you Maya files, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, obviously, that gets a little more interesting when uh, textures are involved, because I do not want you to have to make a whole bunch of file associations. Yeah, I'd prefer not to do that. No, that's just a nightmare. Uh, it's a real, real pain. So, uh, are you fine with them sending you um, a few image files? Like if they did a, a you know a really basic, straightforward uh, default lighting render of each piece, like if you know like six little images, and just save those out, would that be okay? Yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay, then that's the way we're going to handle it. Because uh, I want this to be easy on you too. So. Render each of these. Your render settings need to be the following. 640 by 480. JPEGs. If you don't know how to do that, that's okay. I will show you. If you go over to your render settings, under the common tab, you can change your resolution. It should be 640 by 480 by default, so that makes things a lot easier. Now you can just render out just like that. Just go ahead, create a render, and then actually this is the way I would recommend you do it. So you know, get a nice view of your cake, render that. Make sure you have mental ray on, as I showed you earlier. As a matter of fact, let me write that down. Turn it on now and not later. If you need to see one more time how to do that, again, just go to Window, Settings Preferences, go to the Plugin Manager, and if you scroll to the bottom, you'll see Maya to MR. Make sure that's loaded and set to Auto Load. And then under your Render Settings, you'll have to set Render Using over to Mental Ray. Very, very straightforward. But just make sure that your uh, image size is set to 640 by 480. Then while you're in here, you can just go to File, Save Image, and it automatically wants to save to JPEG, as far as I know. Um, it may try to save to other things, but just set that to JPEG, give it a name, like cake, and click Save. Very, very straightforward. What will be in your Dropbox for your submission is just those six images. And then that way, uh, Chris should be able to just open up and scroll through them really quickly and see that you have everything. Are there any questions about this? Zach, is there a way to select a group? For example, I made a vase with flowers in it and want to select it all at once. Sure thing. Uh, have you grouped it all together with Control G? Uh, because if you have, then you can come up here to your status line and make sure you click Select by Hierarchy and Combinations. Just click that, and that will automatically select the highest level node. So for instance, watch this. I'm going to grab my cake uh, and my plate and my whipped cream and hit Control G. Now that's all in a group. The problem is that by default, if I just click on any one of these objects, I'm just still clicking on that individual component, and that's annoying. Uh, if we verify that, we can go to Panels and jump over to Panel. Let me jump over to the... Uh, what do I want to see? The Hypergraph would be good. Um, relationship Editor, Reference Editor, that's none of what I want. Why don't I see what I want in here? Is it right in front of me and I just don't see it? No, I don't think so. So let's just go to Window, Hypergraph, and open up the Hierarchy. There we go. So there's my group, right? But if I click on any one of the objects in between, you see what I'm actually getting. I'm getting the children of the group. If I set this to select by hierarchy and combinations, I automatically get that group node. So just do that, and that makes things easier. Uh, an interesting thing about that, watch this. Uh, let me make a temporary uh, material. This is just so you don't have to follow along. This is just for your own edification. Uh, right click, go to graph, clear out the graph, let me make a brand new, I don't know, blin. I haven't made a blin really for anything yet. And let's make its color something atrocious like magenta. Now, if I have an entire group selected, 
I can right click and choose assign material to selection and notice that assigns it to all objects underneath the group. So that is definitely useful. And I'm just going to undo and make all that go away. So hopefully that makes that make sense. Um, are there any other questions? Zach, I rotated my table texture and later changed my view to match your Z axis. How do I get back to reset the texture placement? Well, you can only hope to do that if you haven't yet deleted history. Really, the only trick to this is to uh, select your cake, and if you still have the inputs, uh, just click on your polysphere projection. So you need to have that, uh, that node. Now, here's the trick. Notice right now you still don't see anything. Hit the T key, and that opens up the Show Manipulator tool, and that brings up the manipulator for your texture, so you can go back to rotating or adjusting or making any little changes to your input that you need to. If at any point along the way you went to Edit, Delete by Type History, and you killed that off, then what you're going to need to do instead is actually probably make another map. That's the way I'd handle it, uh, because if you went to the uh, UV Texture Editor, your UVs are probably really confusing at this point. And I wouldn't want to mess with that. So I would just go back to create UVs and do another spherical map and then edit that accordingly. So that's the way I would do it. All right, so um, I am thinking that that is everything we need to do. Zach, how do I kill a mutated cake that is on the verge of sprouting evil spawns? Uh, quickly, unplug your computer from the wall before you try this. Rip all cables out of it that you may have. Take your uh, computer and open up its case. Set it inside your bathtub and just turn on the faucet. And that should solve that problem, I'm thinking. I'm pretty sure that will work. Uh, of course, 3D Buzz is not responsible for any damages to your hardware uh, from following any of those directions, because I'm not a computer technician. All right, so um, that is everything. There are no more questions rolling out. I guess you guys are all done and happy. So um, I'd like to thank you all, and I will catch you all next week on the Maya 101 class. Until then, good night, everyone.